Today on The State of Us, flooding and nuclear waste eat away at a tribe's ancestral home. And as miners chase clean energy minerals, tribes fear a repeat of the past. Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by our friendly redneck liberal and senior historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance L. Jackson. Today, the federal government allowed a stockpile of spent fuel on a Minnesota reservation to balloon even as a dam project whittled down the amount of livable land. And mining the minerals that may be needed for a green energy revolution could devastate tribal lands. The Biden administration will be forced to choose. Ah, nothing too big to take on today. <laughs> Not at all. What is the word of the day, Lance? Well, the word of the day is five syllables, circumlocution. Circumlocution, it is a noun, and it means a roundabout, indirect, or lengthy way of expressing something, which I feel describes the United States government and these companies when they're dealing with these American Indian tribes. There's a lot of circumlocution that goes on. And we're going to try to work through that and give you just the straight poop and nothing but the poop okay. uh, about what's going on Cut here. Cut through that circumlocution. Yep. And okay. get right into it here. So in southeastern Minnesota, the Prairie Island Indian community calls this land home and it's now about one third of its original size. Um, back in 1936, the Army Corps of Engineers installed a dam system just south along the Mississippi River, and it has repeatedly flooded the tribe's land, including their burial mounds and leaving members with only 300 livable acres. At the same time, the federal government has put a stockpile of nuclear waste from a power plant next to the reservation which the federal government reneged on a promise to remove in the 1990s, and the stockpile has tripled in size, at times coming within 600 yards of some of the residents' homes. And what's really interesting there is that back in the 1990s, a judge uh, opposed putting nuclear waste on Prairie Island because of the government's history of failing to find a permanent storage facility and, re and a record of broken promises to tribal communities. Um, so the courts ruled in favor of the Indian tribe. The state and federal government allowed it anyway. You heard it, folks. Okay. So the courts say, yeah, don't do that because you can't be trusted. And the state and federal government said, yeah, well, we're going to do it anyway. And what are you going to do about it? So in doing that, the XL Energy Prairie Island Nuclear Power Plant has paid the tribe money over the last few years. And the tribe then has used this to purchase 1,500 acres of new land within a 50-mile radius of the reservation. And what they're asking the government to do is to allow them to put it into a trust, which means then it can be part of the reservation and will belong to the Indians. And then the tribe says in return, they will not sue the government over the flooding caused by the dam for the last 75 years. So we've got another promises made, promises broken. We say we're going to do this. We don't do this. The courts even step in and say, yeah, you can't do this. We're going to do it anyway. And so now you have people living in harm's way. They've been very... Uh, smart, I believe, in taking the money that's been paid to them by the company to then purchase land uh, about 35 miles away. And then they're asking the government very simply, allow us to preserve our future by adding this land away from the power plant to the reservation. Because on top of that, there are more than 150 tribal members who want to live on the ancestral land of their people who are on a waiting list because the amount of land they have to live on continues to get smaller and smaller because of the flooding. And the people then have taken the money that they've been paid to live in this health risk and bought land 
so that they could increase the size of their reservation in a safer place. And all they're asking the government to do is to validate it so that the reservation can be 30 miles away from the nuclear power plant so that they can move on there. And hey, you know what? We won't even sue you for all the damage you've done and the broken treaty that you've made with us. Why is the U.S. government dragging its feet? Do we know? Do we know? <laughs> no, we don't know. Other okay. than, I was hoping you were going to have the inside scoop and no. could tell us what, why they're being. Well, a pain. it's your, it's your typical circumlocution. Uh-huh. You have the federal government saying, "Well, this isn't our problem. This is the problem of the nuclear power plant and the waste site, the nuclear waste site here." Um, and XL, the company, is saying, "Well, no, this is what the government told us to do with this stuff, and we've done it." And we're willing to work with the Indians, but we're waiting for the federal government to take the lead. And so it's the finger pointing going back and forth while the people continue to lose their land to flooding from a dam that wasn't supposed to be built in the first place. And now the government going over the court order of saying no more has tripled the amount of nuclear waste being stored next to the flooded region. And the two powers that the tribe are beholding to are arguing back and forth over who has the right to do what and who needs to do what first. And in the meantime, the people are getting screwed. That's about as straight to the story as I can get there. That's the, not, not trying to, I'm not taking sides like, at all. Okay. I'm just presenting the facts. Cut and dry. This is what's going on, people. Straight talk. You know, and I don't know about you. Liberal. I hadn't heard about this. No. Nope. But it's been going on since the 1930s. Okay. I mean, there is, well, actually, it goes back to 1862, talking about one of the early treaties that was signed with the Native Americans in this area. Not only has the United States managed to devastate the land and take more than what we had agreed to, but we have also endangered their health and possibly trapped them in the desecrated land because of actions that we take. Pretty close. And, okay. and, 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 but now, you know, people would say, well, the nuclear waste company did pay the tribe two and a quarter million dollars uh, a year and have paid them anywhere between 1.45 million and the 2.25 million over the last 10 or 15 years. Well, that's where the tribe then being smart They've used that money to purchase the second parcel of land that they want to now be included on the reservation for $15.5 million. So it's not like they wasted the money and even used it to build arcane things that don't matter. The tribe saved the money that they were paid for living in this dangerous situation and then used it to purchase land that all they're asking from the U.S. government is to let us include this in part of our reservation, even though it's 35 miles away from the current location so that we can then uproot the people that are in harm's way and also then allow 150 more people who want to live on the reservation. We would actually have enough land for them to move into and live on. We've talked obviously a lot about, you know, if we make a promise, we should keep a promise. On the other hand, I think that something that should be done is the notion that a already federally recognized tribe okay, has to get the federal government's permission to use land that they already own as part of their nation. I'm sorry, but somebody sent us an email and explained to me how that makes the slightest bit of sense, right? That's that's like the federal government telling me that, you know, well, I own this field here and I own this field next to it. And in order for me to make use of this field that I just bought, I need your permission to do it. Even though I already own it, I paid for it. It's mine, but I can't use it because I need your okay. But now they're looking to expand it. And that's outside of the parameters of the original treaty. Therefore they have to get permission from their white father to do that. Right. I mean, and I'm being very sarcastic which, here. Which, 
Wh- which I think is stupid. Right. I, I guess I'll what agree I'm with you. I, I, I think we should do away with that. If a if a tribe was that a rhetorical question or did you want an answer? No, I mean, no, no. no. If if a tribe is answer. if a tribe is recognized, okay, federally. So in other words, the government has already said yes. This is a this is a legitimate tribal nation, right? This is you know a recognized. American Indian or indigenous people tribe of some kind. We've already taken that step. They already have a reservation. They already have land. I do not think that the federal government should be able to stop them from land that they bought with their own money, you know, from incorporating that into their nation. That I don't think is okay. I mean, it just seems wrong. It seems wrong that why would why would the United States which is a separate it's it's almost like the United States telling Canada that if Canada bought Greenland Canada can't incorporate Greenland into Canada. Like what? I mean it, it doesn't no. It, I I just sorry. I don't dis- I don't disagree I, I, with you. Ooh, stupid. We should eradicate the need for federal government permission. If they could pay for the land, I don't see any reason that that, that you know big brother U.S. federal government should have any say over whether or not it's part of their tribe, which is supposedly its own nation anyway. Mm. So, I mean, lots of problems, obviously. Gotta love it. Lots of problems, but not the least of which is like classic case of, well, where do you send stuff that nobody else wants near them? Well, of course, you send it to the Indians because that's what we've always done. Or to other marginally based neighborhoods. Right. We know that, right? How many times have we talked about your success or failure and your health or illness is equated to your zip code? Mm -hmm. And how many times do we build power plants in poor Hispanic or African-American neighborhoods? Yep. Or, oh, mm, lead. Or run the pipeline through Native American lands. or or, Right. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, on and on, right? Because here's this thing that nobody else wants and you can have it. It's all yours. You know, we, we're ne- we, you just do your thing until we figure out that there's something there that we want. And now we're going to take it because all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't matter what we said. It doesn't or matter. You what don't we want it in to. your backyard and I don't want it in my backyard. Well, we'll build it to, in these people's backyards. Right. Because they have no political power. Or right. Political because they clout. can't do anything. Right. So they just have to submit to whatever. Oh, anyway, um, I wish it stopped there, but it doesn't. And part of this is a conversation about because nuclear waste, right? Um, something that is nuclear energy, part of our transition as a nation to renewable energy, um, is is a reality that nuclear energy is part of that. But now, a new issue: as miners are chasing clean energy minerals, tribes are fearing a repeat of the past. Why? Well, surprise! The mining, mining the minerals that may be needed for a green energy revolution could devastate certain tribal lands or lands that they depend on. How is that and what could be done about it? Well, to find out, keep it here on The State of Us and we'll be right back. Antimony. Antimony, Lance. You ever heard of antimony? Not until I read this article, but it okay. sounds like a very important mineral that the United States is going to need in the future, quite possibly. Well, deep in the Salmon River Mountains, an Idaho mining company, Perpetua Resources, is proposing a vast open pit gold mine that would also produce 115 million pounds of antimony. And that's an element that may be critical to manufacturing the high capacity liquid metal batteries of the future. So um, this is obviously the priority of the Biden administration, right? Supposedly two priorities um, that we care about that are in conflict here. One, uh, respect existing uh, treaties and do no harm uh, to no undue harm, I guess put it that way, to Native Americans and other indigenous people and their reservations, tribes, and lands. So that's a priority. Other priority, again, what the administration tells us, right, is making the transition to green energy. Well, now we got a problem because we need antimony. Well, we actually don't know that we need antimony. We think we need antimony for these new batteries, the 
that we don't know will work. <laughs> right. There's, so there's just, a supposition so, that we might so, be able to create on. a battery <laughs> using this stuff that could work. And right now, the only antimony being mined is in China. Right. So there's another flag being thrown up as to another hmm, issue. Do we want to depend on China for something that we may need in the future to power our homes and cars? And it's not just antimony, to be clear. It's also things like cobalt, lithium. Some of these you've probably heard of, right? Lithium ion batteries, which are probably if you if you have a cell phone, which I imagine you do if you listen to this show, even our friendly redneck liberal has one. It's probably powered by a lithium ion battery, right? So lithium, cobalt, um, antimony, copper, these are all things that are part of the green energy revolution, right? Now, there are several ways that you can get these. Um, one way is mining them, right? Digging into the earth, blowing things up, and pulling it out. That's one way, right? I can pull out a battery out of the ground? Well, pretty much. I mean, you can pull out all the things you need for the battery. Oh, okay. Somebody still got to put, put it together. together. But yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Did you ever do that thing, you know, in science class where we put the the copper over here and the zinc over here, right? And then we, I'm oversimplifying this, but then we, you know, tie a wire between them and we turn on the light bulb. Nope, I'm so old. And not quite we, that simple. We, I'm sure there's people out there who are like, uh, what? <laughs> I never had to do anything like that in science class. That is my weak area. So that's why I'm trying to learn. Yes. So, but anyway... You know, making. I thought a, you stuck it in a potato and it made the light bulb go. Well, there you go. Yeah, the potato. Um, you can. Everybody listening can tell that Lance and I are big science people. <laughs> the potato or the copper or the light bulb or I. <laughs> something happened. Thank and you, the light Thomas bulb Edison. Came on. We, all right. use, we all use the light bulb oh, in science class. Dear. Anyway, point being that yes, you know what we need for batteries comes from the earth. Um, so we can mine more of it, right? The other thing we can do is recycle it. You know, you, if you've had a phone long enough, you notice that over time, right? What happens? Oh, the battery's not so hot anymore. Eh, you get a new phone. Well, what happens to that old phone? Eh, in the trash, you know, in the trash. Go bury it, right? That's what, that's what we do with most stuff. Well, the good news is that actually many types of batteries can be recycled, including lithium ion batteries. Um, now, we do a real bad job at that right now. We don't recycle hardly any of them. Um, it's not easy enough to recycle them, both from a, it's hard if Lance is ready to get rid of his phone, right? What? Where do I take this? I mean, how do I recycle this? Even if I want to, and a lot of people don't care whether or not they do, but even if you're a good-hearted Samaritan like Lance, you're willing to be a little bit inconvenienced to recycle this little tiny battery that, you know, moral licensing says, right, doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but he's going to do it anyway, by God. Well, where does he take it? Well, I don't know. And then if he takes it there, how easy is it to recycle? Well, it's challenging to recycle. Okay, so we have some problems there, right? Um, but those are two different ways uh, that we can acquire them. We can either recycle, um, thrown out and discarded things that contain those minerals, of which there's a lot, um, or we can get new, or what we actually have to do is a combination of those two. Problem is that a lot of these minerals, right, when you mine minerals, you cause damage to the area around you. Um, so how do you do it responsibly? We're still figuring that out. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, and here's the thing. With the mining that's already gone on in this area, the Nez Perce Indians, they use the Chinook salmon like the Plains Indians used the buffalo. It is the lifeblood of their community, their culture, their heritage. And they believe they've been put in charge of the salmon. And with all of the mining, uh, all the wastewater, all goes down into the rivers, oh, kills the salmon. The, the dams that have been built to create hydroelectric power cause roadblocks for the salmon to the point that there were just like 40 or 50 salmon a couple of years ago that managed to make that natural swim from where they were you know born back there so they could spawn again. I mean, we're talking about taking the lifeblood of an entire group of people away because of the mining that we've already done. And now we have a company proposing, well, now we're going to 
we want the rights to make this, to mine this material because it's going to benefit us in the future. But what does it do to the things that we've already destroyed or in the process of destroying? How much further will it destroy those vital things that we need and affect the environment. A review by the Environmental Protection Agency found that Perpetua's initial plan for a 20-year operation would inflict, quote, disproportionately high and adverse impacts on tribes, according to a November 2020 letter from the agency. And environmental groups have warned that the mine could damage or destroy huge swaths of fish habitat. Across the American West, tribal nations are on the front lines of a new debate over how to balance the needs and cost of clean energy. Extracting the fuels of the future is a process that is often far from clean. And just as fights over the environmental cost of oil exploration helped define the fossil fuel era, conflicts like this one are creating the battle lines of the next energy revolution, contends this New York Times article, which, of course, is linked at thestateofus.org. The choices are destined to grow more challenging as commodities like lithium, copper, cobalt, and antimony become more valuable and critical to the nation's future. The tribes say the mines would damage their hunting and fishing lands, siphon scarce water, and desecrate burial grounds and ceremonial sites. In Nevada, there are uh, two tribes that are protesting a mining company's efforts to blast apart a dormant volcano to dig for lithium, which is a critical mineral used in batteries for electric cars. In the Big Sandy River Valley in Arizona, another lithium mining project could destroy a hot spring considered sacred by another tribe. And federal mining law grants private companies enormous power to, t- to stake claims and dig on public lands often despite arguments that mines violate treaty-guaranteed rights to fish, hunt, and collect plants. Tribal members have also tried unsuccessfully to argue that mines would illegally prevent them from praying and practicing their religions on sacred public lands. But the legal ground may be shifting. A 2020 Supreme Court decision, which the state of us covered, expanded tribal sovereignty in Oklahoma and ordered the federal government to uphold the commitments it made in treaties with the Creek Nation. Under the decision, the state of Oklahoma could lose its power to oversee coal mining on tribal lands, and tribes elsewhere are making reinvigorated legal arguments that propose mines violate their treaty rights. The Nez Prez gave up about half of their ancestral lands while retaining a right to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed places. But that wasn't enough, because soon after, Gold was discovered within their reservation. With prospectors flocking to the region, the U.S. government initiated a new treaty negotiation that shrank the reservation by 90%. As tribe members refer to themselves, the 1863 agreement became known as the Steel Treaty. Perpetua has won over many nearby residents by promising to repair the damage done by more than a century of mining. It says it will restore creeks now channeled into rock line ditches and reconnect the severed section of river so fish can swim freely. There have been years of cleanup efforts at the site, but Perpetua says it alone is willing to undertake a full-scale restoration that could cost $100 million. Gee, why would they spend $100 million? They'd have to be making a lot more than $100 million if they're going to spend $100 million. And the other thing, I think here's, here's, here's how— You mean they're bo- not doing it out of the goodness of their heart? Well, no. They're doing it because they— I'm, I'm trying to, you know, to provide— you know, to cut through that circumlocution that's going on here. Oh, look, we're going to do a hundred thousand, a hundred million dollars worth of good stuff for you, and blah 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 blah. And I think one of one of the people in the article say sometimes it feels like we're being bribed to go along with this, and that's my point. Well, right? you are being bribed. I mean, I let's I let's just be clear. But I'm pretty so, you know, sure. Let's, let's cut right through the chase. Let's cut through the chase, and that, that's exactly what's going on. Now, would cleaning up and restoring river connections be valuable? Absolutely. Um, But uh, I think that it's important to understand that a bribe is simply to persuade someone to act in one's favor um, by a gift of money or other inducement. It It is typically illegally or dishonestly, but it doesn't have to be. So it's not illegal to offer this money to them, right? I suppose dishonest is a matter of perspective. But even if it's not illegal or dishonest, it's still a bribe because they're offering them this money to get them to agree to let them do it, right? 
I mean, that I, that is what is happening. We'll give you this, <laughs> so you'll let us do that. Right. Um, you know, so I think the hundred million to restore that stuff, it sounds great. Obviously, one of my concerns is that what the EPA is saying will happen and what they're saying will happen don't match up yet. Now, if we can get to the we're going to do 100 million and the EPA is going to say, yes, this will substantially improve things. It will outweigh any negative impacts, you know, and make a positive impact on the land to come. Now we're talking about something a little bit different, but I don't love that Perpetua, who is a mining company, right, says that they know better than the EPA and that they promise that it'll be okay. I mean, that sounds a lot to me like the nuclear waste thing that we were just talking about, right? We promise, we promise it'll be, we promise to move this. And instead of moving it, we tripled the size of it. Different part of the country, but it looks like the same outcome. Right. I mean, that's just what it sounds like. So, so now the question becomes, well, what do we do about any of this, right? Because it's easy to say, well, one of two things. We got to have the minerals. So it just is what it is, right? We got to have these different elements, rare earth minerals. So we just have to, we just have to do it, you know, and it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. So you could say that you could also say, uh, no, it's their land. We're not doing it. And you know, the planet be damned. Who cares if we live another 50 years, as long as, you know, these people's way of life is preserved in the meantime, then it doesn't matter. Those are obviously two extremes. So is there another option? Well, to find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. Climate change is coming for us, Lance. We've been talking about it on this show quite a lot over the past number of years. Okay, it's been coming for us since man stepped foot on the earth. Well... Yeah, I mean, we we have an idea that, you know, any substantive adjustments to the climate probably started with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Yes, we were having impacts on it before then, but they were so minor that our ability to shift the global dynamic was limited because we didn't produce enough. We didn't cause enough disruption to the climate that the climate couldn't make up for the disruption we caused. Um, obviously, what we now know is that uh, ever since we, you know, introduced the era of productivity and the great expansion of human society across the face of the planet and greatly increased the number of people and built cars and factories and introduced a wave of productivity, we have also simultaneously induced a wave of destruction, <laughs> uh, which at some point we crossed that tipping point where, uh, what we are doing is unsustainable, right? We are taking more than we return. What, what will happen is we will unnaturally, right, force climate in a direction that becomes unsustainable, which for us will be a chain reaction of eventually, right, drastically reducing the human population, which over probably thousands of years, the natural way of the planet will slowly heal itself again back to some level of stability. There you go. <clears throat> yeah. So as long as we're okay with the death of billions of people, then there's nothing to worry about. That's right. <laughs> just want to make that clear to people. Okay. All right. That there is a natural way for this to all take place. Well, it just, this just means humans will not populate is, the spaces like they do now. There is a natural solution to an unnatural problem, Right. We have created a problem that it flies in the face of the harmony of the earth. Well, we've made it worse. I think we know definitively that we are now, you know, the the single single largest reason that global warming is taking place, along with other climate related catastrophe. You know, if, for example, okay, just to illustrate, right? If we went back and the industrial revolution never took place. And we lived much like we did in the seven, you know, probably up to the mid 1800s. You know, if we were still living like that and if the world's population was still where it was, there is, you know, a very good understanding that what we're talking about right now in the climate change, we wouldn't need to be talking about. OK, with all of this, everybody's probably listening, saying, Lance, what's, what's your point? OK, my point is this. 
who gives us the right to go in and destroy other people so that we can continue to, to live the way we want to live? That's my point. It's like, okay, we've done this. We've made our bed. Let's live in it. What right do we have to go destroy other people so that we can hang on a little bit longer for doing something that we didn't realize was bad. Now we know it's bad. The sides have been outlined, I think, pretty well. The question is, is there anything other than one or the other? Because that's, I mean, that's the way the article pitches it, right? Is, well, we want to stop climate change, so we need these minerals. And in order to do that, we have to destroy somebody's way of life and probably, you know, substantially reduce their population over time and destroy their ancestral history. Or we can respect their ancestral history and we can leave them alone and not get these minerals. And then our ability to, you know, combat climate change is substantially reduced. And so then, you know, other people suffer. So it's it's a bad situation. You know, it's a bad situation because the way it is pitched is you're going to hurt somebody, right? Somebody is going to get hurt, you know, one way or the other. Somebody is going to come out the loser. I think... But I don't know. I mean, it takes people who are probably smarter than Lance and I sitting here to have the money to do the research to figure out, is there a way, you know, to do mining in a much more responsible way that does not, you know, totally devastate the land that the mining is done on? Because it's not just... It is not just a tribal issue. It's also land that's being mined all across the world that we destroy, right? Not just here in the United States, but everywhere. But how can you do that? And now I'm going to sound, make a lot of people upset and do away with capitalism because there's a way to do it, right? It's, let's say instead of a hundred million dollars that it's going to take to do this, it's going to take $3 trillion to do it. Well, then the company will perpetual will walk away from it because they're like, well, we're not, we're only going to make 2 trillion out of mining this. And so we're not, we're, we only exist for our stockholders and we can't go into business when we know we're going to lose a trillion dollars, even though we could do this in a respectable way that we could get the minerals out, fix the mistakes we've, we've made, the harm we've done, fix the harm we've done, to the planet and still get the stuff out that we need so that we can continue to work on saving the planet. But it's going to cost so much that we're going to lose money. on. I think it, I think it returns to that whole, what we've talked about before, which is the federal government, right? Of the United States has invested many, many billions and billions of dollars and maybe into the trillions when adjusted for inflation over the years in figuring out more productive, safer, better ways to go for coal and to go for oil, right? I mean, the federal government has underwritten that. And why did they underwrite it? Because of the very thing that Lance is talking about. Private companies looked at it and they said, yeah, I'm not really sure we can get into this. You know, you want us to make these changes, but I, you know, it doesn't work for our bottom line for me to invest in this change, you know, because I'm going to spend so much damn money on the research and the mitigation efforts that when you add those two together, I can't make enough money to make it worth my while. So I'm not going to do it. So what did the federal government do? The federal government said, well, we'll write you a check to help you get it figured out, you know, and then we'll give you lots of breaks in order to meet the obligations that we're going to put in place. And where does all that money that the federal government is giving to the companies come from? Well, it should come from, right, me, Lance, and other American taxpayers. In reality, obviously, a little portion of it comes from us, the taxpayers, and a big portion comes from borrowing. Uh, but I will also point out, because I think this is very important to note, when the federal government was doing that, and I'm talking about from like the 1920s through the 1970s, the corporate tax rate sat at an average of 70%. Exactly. Okay. So now, now we're getting to where I wanted to go. Right. That's so just my to point. Be, right. Just to be fair. It you can know, be done if we're willing to make the sacrifices. If we're willing to pay what right. it costs. Right. You know, um, so what, in other words, you know, brass tax, what am I saying we should do? Well, one thing is I think that you have to bring along um, the tribes, right? The Indians and other um, 
indigenous people, you got to bring them along as part of the process. And I don't mean in a, you know, well, what do you think? Well, we don't like it. Okay, well, we're going to do it anyway. That's not what I mean, right? I mean, giving them an actual say, an actual vote in what happens, you know, meaning that if they vote no, it might not happen, you know, understanding that the only way you're going to get them to trust what you're promising to do is if you extend trust by saying, we're going to give you influence over whether it happens or not. You know, we are putting our fate into your hands as much as we're asking you to put your fate in our hands, because if that's not there, then the whole thing doesn't work. And that's why, I mean, in my opinion and my limited understanding of our negotiations, the reason that they don't trust us is because they got no freaking reason to trust us. You know, I wouldn't trust us because you'll trust us, you know, it'll be fine. You know, but we don't we don't reciprocate that by giving them any uh, any equal amount of trust. You know, it's all one way. It's all trust us until we decide that we don't want to do it that way anymore. And then you need to trust us again because we got a better way. You know, no. So I think they got to be involved in it. I think there is a way to set it up. The two solutions that we're talking about here, neither of them are good. Right. Somebody wins and somebody loses. And that's not ideal. So can we, is there a way to move forward together, truly together? And I think the answer is, there is almost always a way to move forward together. To Lance's point, how much are we willing to sacrifice to do that? I think we've cut through the circumlocution today. And folks, let us know. I mean, what do you think? Are you as upset about this as we are? Um, Or do you think, oh, it doesn't really matter? Let us know. Either way, um, Send us an email. Podcast at the state of us dot org, right? Exactly. So, uh, Lance, why did we have this conversation today? Well, because True Chat has a mission, and that mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And once again, I think we fulfilled this mission. We need to hear from you. You need to tell your friends, tell them to join us. So the more of us that are having these conversations, we can lead to the changes that we need to make so that we can continue to walk around on this planet without harming it. So tell your friends, family, they can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. I'd recommend people take an opportunity to check out earthworks.org. Okay. I'm going to be linking the PDF um, that I was able to locate during the show today. And it's an authored independent report on the challenges of mining the various elements and minerals that we will need to combat climate change. It was commissioned for the sole purpose of determining what the demand is going to be and how our current plans are inadequate and what the new plans need to be to respect the areas that we mine. So to Lance's point, the solutions are out there. What's it going to cost, though? And who's going to pay? Um, it can be done, right? It can be done. The State of Us is available as a podcast Tuesdays and Thursdays, first thing in the morning, and heard on AM and FM talk radio stations around the country on the weekends. For The State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to Bradley Butch, our producer. Thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.